Wrong. So uh, without any further ado, let's go over the panel here. My name is Kari Lehtonen. I am the business development lead in here in digital workforce. Uh, we are a company specialized in intelligent process automation, especially services around that. And with me, we have Steve, Carly, and Oli. I'll uh, hand over to Steve to introduce himself. Steve, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm the one waving. Uh, welcome to our webinar. Uh, I'm CEO of Combined Intelligence. We're a UK-based consultancy business focused on helping organizations realize the full potential of intelligent technologies. Key one being intelligent process automation, but also related technologies such as artificial intelligence and augmented analytics. I'll hand over to Carly. Hi, thank you. So me waving here. Head of service development, digital workforce. I have the luxury of following up the industry uh, very closely for the past five years. And I have to say how excited I am about how quickly the market is moving and actually kind of uh, how much I, I have learned myself from this webinar series. So it's it's been a tremendous pleasure to be part of it and also here answering your questions. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Oli. Um, I'm a co-founder for Edge Tech. We're a recruitment and headhunting company that focus on disruptive technologies and our main focus is RPA, intelligent automation, and any technology that I guess surround and, surround and augments that um, working out of UK, Europe, and, and North America. Fantastic. So Steve, um, will you run us through your presentation, please? Thank you, Carrie. Um, so what I'm gonna to endeavor to do in the next 10 minutes is very quickly take you through aspects of what we covered in our video series. Um, what we tried to do was introduce IPA but then pick up on you know, some of the main drivers, some of the opportunities, some of the challenges even, uh, and to look a bit about what the future holds uh, for this and for organizations and the future of work and, and, and how technology um, and change will impact organizations moving forward. If you want to catch any of those videos, we will share links um, with an email. We'll follow up to anyone that's sort of attended or registered um, for this event today. So what I'll start with is just talking about what we consider IPA to be. Um, realistically speaking, it's bringing together the worlds of process automation and whether that's robotic process automation, whether that's low or no code platforms or even traditional middleware integration capabilities. Um, it's that world of automating of business processes. Um, and it brings in you know, process mining, the actual aspect of understanding and gathering information about how you automate processes, uh, as well as sort of the actual implementation delivery of process automation. But we then combine that with artificial intelligence. And that actually is a very broad field. Um, whether we talk about computer vision, we talk about things like conversational AI and natural language processing. Um, you know, there's a lot of developments around this world and it's a very hot topic in the same way as, as RPA, for example, has been over the last few years. There's a lot of opportunity to get greater value from our data. And, you know, that combination of adding intelligence into what we achieve through automation is going to allow us to achieve a lot more. And I think that's the key thing that we'll try and cover today is that, you know, value of going beyond what a lot of organizations I think have started with, which is sort of task-based automation. Um, I will try and pick up and discuss some of those aspects a little through our questions and answers that we go through a bit later. Um, one other thing, because there's obviously lots of terms going on in the world, uh, what we consider the combination of intelligent process automation and achieving that at scale is really equivalent to what some people might call hyper-automation. So really we're, co we're covering hyper automation as well as IPA uh, in this presentation today. So why do you need it? Um, well, you know, a lot of organizations have looked at automation um, about, you know, introducing the capability to automate what people currently do, to eliminate the mundane, the repetitive tasks, uh, and ultimately quite often driven to deliver cost savings and to save the organization money in how they deliver services. 
And that's brought in the rise of this sort of digital workforce um, where we have technology, quite often bots, are running processes and are doing automations, things that human beings used to do. But actually, there's a lot of opportunity to go beyond that, you know, to go beyond sort of taking you know, what traditionally people have done and just doing it through technology. We've now got vast quantities of data, whether that's data that's being gathered by devices, sensors, by applications, systems, and now by process automations that we can actually get greater value from whether we start to use that value for, for insight in terms of how the business is, is performing, but also to predict and to make decisions um, and to use that intelligence in, in that sort of our automations to actually make automatic decisions rather than having to revert to a, to a human being at each stage of a process. So that opportunity to automate, but also to go further, to innovate uh, and ultimately to, to look at how we can transform, you know, some of these technologies like AI, for example, are changing how we interact with technology. You know, we have Alexa, we have Siri, we have all of those sort of uh, technologies that smart devices that we can now communicate through via voice. You know, to be able to hold a conversation with technology will become a much greater reality over the coming years. But it's important when we interact with that technology, it's not only answering sort of knowledge based questions, but it actually can go away and do things for us. And that capability brings in the world of process automation and how do we connect those two capabilities together to really differentiate in how we operate plus in the experience that we provide to our customers and our citizens. So really we look at this as a transformational opportunity and the potential is very large. If organizations can see that and realize that and go beyond the initial automation capabilities they typically start with. Now, hopefully most of you would have seen that we sent a bit of a survey email out, um, which was seeking your input on where, on a number of questions, one of which was where you are on your IPA journey. What we're also going to do now is show the first poll um, and ask you to, to give us your opinion of where you are in your um, life cycle. So we've looked at, you know, we have people that might be perhaps haven't yet started through the various stages of the life cycle to actually being at scale with automation and just wanting to look at greater use of AI uh, or you know, fully embracing it. Now you can see from the results we got through the initial survey is that you know, we have, uh, you know, most people have done some level of process automation and they're somewhere through the life cycle either having achieved initial success, um, looking to build and perhaps scale out, but now also looking to add intelligence and process uh, automation. So it'd be interesting to see where everyone in um, comes in from here. I think we've so far got sort of half the people uh, voted. Uh, something else uh, category, by the way, is just picking up on people perhaps who are not themselves in the middle of a, an IPA program within their business, but perhaps provide consultancy or help others. So feel free to, to select that option at that point. Um, well, what I'll do so I can go on to the next side of things is sort of end the polling at this point. Let's see what the, the results say. So uh, looks like the majority of people have done some RPA or some low code, uh, achieved some benefits, but now are looking to go to the next stage of the process. Um, but we've also got some as well, a reasonable number that have actually achieved a certain amount of scale. And it's now about how do we combine that into AI? So that's quite similar to what we had through the, through the survey. So let me move on to uh, next phase of the process. So what we did talk about through the videos is sort of how do you get going? How do you go through the life cycle? What are the key elements that you need to factor in? Whether that's understanding the vision, the strategy of the organization, picking up the right opportunities, through to having the right sort of culture, the right capabilities within the business, whether that's sponsorship, whether that's skills, whether that's team, whether that's the technology and IT platform, ultimately then around process and life cycle and governance. Um, and quite importantly, the communications, the buy-in, how do we get uh, you know, the organization on board with what we're trying to achieve here? A key element of that is around opportunity. Um, and what we tried to cover off was that depending on where you are in your life cycle, those opportunities will change. You know, 
early days, what you're typically looking to do is find tasks and opportunities to automate, you know, the mundane processes, the ones that are high volume, the ones that can deliver you greater value, but perhaps with, without greater uh, complexity. But as you evolve, you then start to look at more sort of core business critical processes, ones that can deliver you a mix of value, not just sort of time savings, but quality improvements, accuracy, uh, and start ultimately to go into sort of more mature end-to-end -end processes where actually you're looking to re-engineer how the business operates. And to use this technology, perhaps within part of a wider transformation program to really make a difference. Um, and that's how we see the opportunities evolve. Uh, one thing though to pick up on is that, you know, it's not that simple. Um, and what you'll see from this element of the survey uh, is that yes, you know, some organizations have been really successful with these technologies but many have actually found it difficult and have struggled to achieve the level of success um, that they expected or the business wanted. And that's something to consider and factor in it, but it's something, a problem that can be solved uh, when you approach it well. The challenges sort of tend to fit, in, fit into sort of the various different categories of strategy, people, process and technology, um, all of which, as I say, can be solved. One interesting thing we got from the survey, I've sort of not got the results on the thing, is that the key one that most people highlighted was culture. It was that willingness for the organization to accept change and be prepared for change and be on board and embrace it. Um, and that is always a challenge with sort of big programs such as this, but is a key one to factor into any successful program. And what are we looking to achieve? You know, we talked about the combination of the technologies and, and, the, and the benefits and the, that they can achieve, but actually what we'll see is the evolution of business, the evolution of organizations through the use of this technology and the wider sort of technology set and process and cultural change, we'll be migrating from automation of sort of tasks and initial processes through to actually having organizations where a large part of the business is being run autonomously. Um, and that brings in, you know, a key element about what happens with the, the, the people workforce and how that evolves and, and the importance of, you know, factoring in that change as well as the introduction of process automation. You know, people bring a lot of opportunity around innovation, around people interaction, around, you know, intelligent decision making that is going to be beyond what, you know, technology can currently do. It's about migrating that workforce to, to, to bring in the real value to the business through that, as well as making better use of the digital workforce. And to end my 10 minutes-ish, um, one final survey for you, um, if that's okay, where we pick up and look at what aspects of intelligent process automation interest you the most. When we did our survey, we allowed people to answer multiple questions, but in here we'll just sort of pick up on one of the key areas of technology, whether that's you know, process mining and how intelligent tech can actually help you find the opportunities through things like document processing, you know, whether that's conversion of sort of paper documents or scan documents or actually understanding of unstructured text, things like conversational AI, interaction with people at the front end and how that can then be automated through the use of machine learning and the complexities around, you know, what can we actually get out of our data? How can ML capabilities, for example, extract patterns and understanding and use that for insight? Um, and how can great, what greater value? Now, how are we doing? So we're about halfway through in terms of people. I'll just give you a few more seconds to answer some of those questions, to make sure everyone's awake. We get up to 50% almost. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. We just topped, up, topped the limit. So uh, where we are with it, so what we can see is the highest one is that intelligent decision making. Um, and that's consistent with what we had on the survey as well, as well as a range of other opportunities that we can use these intelligence techs. So good to see uh, people interested in where the future holds and, and how we go. So I hope that was interesting from a, a very quick intro, and I appreciate I did speak quickly. Um, we'll now move on to sort of the Q&A uh, section, and I'll hand back to, to Carrie at this point. Well, thank you, Steve. That's, that's a great presentation and good recap of, of those, those seven 
mini web webinar series that that we run. Uh, let's let's start our Q and A session. So again, I want to thank people who actually sent in uh, questions in in advance, and and uh, uh, we we're sort of taking those on board and and then added a few of our own to the list as well. But let's let's uh, let's go around the let's go around the table. So so gentlemen, if you just remember to unmute yourself before we start answering, but. Uh, my first question for the for the panel would be that uh, what is it that really excites you the most in, in intelligent prose automation? I'll start with start with Carly. All right, thank you. Uh, presentation at least uh, dropped out from me, but that's probably what you actually aim to do. But yeah, I think it's a very good question, and for me, there's probably two things at the moment that, or actually, it's that. Uh, other side of the same coin, I would say. So first of all, the market is, is moving so tremendously fast at the moment that there's convergence happening from multiple directions. There's the RPA players, there's IPAS, IPPMS, you just name it. And all of them are trying to somehow position themselves as the middleware, the business operating system of the future business that allows this autonomous business in the future as, as described here. And on top of that, like a kind of a new player, small players, there is Microsoft, Amazon, these kind of big players who have also introduced themselves into the game. So I'm very excited to see where the market goes and especially what is the business value that you can outmeasure from these technologies at any, any uh, pace of time. And that is really my excitement of, of, of uh, intelligent process automation at the moment. Fantastic. That's a, that's a techie view. So maybe let's go over to Oli, who's the expert on, on people. So Oli, what do you think? Yeah, so I think it's, I think that the exciting stuff is when you're looking in a year, two years, three years, however long it's going to be, once it's fully embedded within companies and, and this sort of stuff, you're going to see, you're going to see, I, I'd like to think a bit more of a shift in terms of employee satisfaction and all of this sort of stuff in the fact that they know that they can come in during the day and they've got the stuff that they need to do, but the stuff that they need to do is the stuff that really makes an impact. It's the stuff where they're feeling they're making a difference. They're not just sitting there and having to do all of the mundane tasks that, that they're going to be doing just to try and get all of the admin in order, all of this sort of stuff. The stuff that they're doing is the stuff that they probably got into their career to do. No one gets into their career to do admin Hopefully, I hope you don't have an insult anyone, but people get into their career to make a difference or because something really interests them. And if you can take away all of the mundane around it, it I think it means that people are just going to, that level of satisfaction, life satisfaction, job satisfaction, is just going to see a real increase with as soon as all of this gets real ironed out and just becomes sort of embedded within every company. All right. What about you, Steve? What do you think? Um, for me, and I'm sort of a bit of an enthusiast in this field, it's it's the potential to transform how organizations operate and to make that step change from some where we've been with technologies like RPA, where we've automated almost as is process, you know, taken out what people might have done by, by using technology. But now, actually, if we look at the bigger picture, we look at AI, we look at the wider capabilities, we actually have a way of, of transforming how we deliver end-to-end -end service. And I think that will see big organizational change as well. Um, you know, moving away from perhaps some of the departmental functions and all that that we've traditionally had to use these technologies, but also to make better use of people. Um, so it's that scale of change, I think, and the opportunity that excites me. Good, thanks. Yeah, and, and yeah, just, just to mention, yeah, please do, do put your questions in the chat. We have the first question in the chat. I was gonna, I was gonna ask one of mine, but um, I, I think I'm gonna do so that we'll ask Paul's question, which is how, how do you win over the development team who do not want to move from building systems natively in an old school world to, to this new world of intelligent pros automation? So um, who wants to who wants to have a, have a go at that? I can have a go if you want. Um, sure. uh, just, so my background for many years, I ran development teams, um, software development teams, and you know, it, it is a big transition if you're trying to get developers who like to use Visual Studio, for example, to start to use, uh, you know, drag and drop workflow design tools. Um, 
because they feel that they're no longer in control. You know, it's not really the extent and complexity that they were looking to do. And, and it's not, it's not, you know, they're inter having to interact with people because it's process and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I think that's partly what draws you into having a mixed team, you know, not just developers, but people who actually have process and, and business understanding skills as well. Um, what you have to try and do is, is sort of try and keep the technology people, you know, the developers interested, but there is, you know, if you treat automation as part of a wider transformation program, there are lots of opportunity for you know, development type activities and ML type activities and other things as well as part of a bigger program. Uh, and I know the driver behind a lot of dev people is, is the technology interest and so on. And I think getting that as part of what they do and making sure they get that, that diversity and versatility is sort of key to keeping them on board. Interesting, good, good. All right, um, let's, uh, let's continue with one of our own questions, which, which, is, which goes to Carly this time. So, so, it's, uh, so what's your understanding of the maturity of the process automations across organizations? And kind of like based on the survey we had earlier, like what are, you, what are your thoughts and, and, and views on that one? Perfect, thank you. And actually, yes, as you mentioned, this was a question that came in uh, as part of the polls. So I actually prepared a slide on this one, if, if someone can take that up so we can have a short dialogue around that one. At oh, least that's, for me. Much, that's, that's me doing that, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I also see also that my picture, background picture is wrong way around. I tried to turn it, but I, I didn't have that skill in me. Oh, you look all right. You look all right. <laughs> all right. Yeah, let me, I'm trying to bring it up. Yeah, no problem. But I think kind of, yeah, actually this, this question reminded me about uh, sort of an internal engagement that we did a couple of months ago with our senior uh, engagement managers and consultants on understanding where is our customers in general in the maturity and what how does an intelligent automation maturity curve look like and i actually have pictured that curve into the presentation if you can get it up but the, the, i think the key uh, point here to answer the question first is that there is tremendous differences in in, in different industries, I claim, and also between the organizations. And uh, I think the key, and now we can see it, so, so kind of key phases in your journey is obviously starting with, with the low-hanging fruits or having that scalable RPA uh, capability that is very typical. Taking the tedious, mundane tasks that Oli and people talked about here and really kind of uh, picking up those low-hanging fruits. But the first milestone that you really need to nail in your journey uh, is to have a scalable operating model and really ensure that you lay out horizontally across the whole business your RPA capability. And we tend to see many organizations fall into something that I would call a diminishing cost trap. And, and this is really kind of a, a place where, I don't know, one third of our customers are struggling with these questions that they probably have started from finance or HR or somewhere else in the support functions and what they're actually doing they're optimizing the one percent of the two or the two percent of the overall cost structure of the organization so really moving to the core that that Steve mentioned and and we had the maturity and the opportunity kind of a discussion as well so really ensuring that you go beyond the initial low-hanging fruits and then the kind of, uh, I would say one third or even but more than that is now in here in the kind of a va valley stage, onboarding new technologies, onboarding AI, machine learning, you name it, chatbots. But we claim that the best organizations that have had the best success, the transition actually doesn't start from onboarding new technologies or something that we call a holy tech trap, but actually it is putting your E2E process into the focal point of your analysis, understanding how could you transform the process with the complete intelligent automation stack of technologies that, that Steve talked about earlier. And we had a couple of uh, sessions talking about that. And, and then taking new technologies 
uh, against this use case, this E2E transformation use case and onboarding the technologies against this kind of the process KPIs, uh, process level KPIs. Uh, and then you can move to actually out measuring the real benefits of, of this business operating system or the middleware of automation. And I would say that kind of uh, you find customers along all along this uh, journey at the moment, but most of them are somewhere between the bullet point two and three, trying to figure out how to organize their existing uh, initiatives and how to really nailing nail the onboarding of new technologies into the uh, kind of uh, stack of automation. Right, fantastic. Um, yeah, it's an interesting interesting journey and interesting interesting. Uh, you know, thing that we're all experiencing at the moment. Uh, I was thinking that probably the next question I would ask from Oli is, because you're the expert on this one, I suppose, and Steve, quite you, you as well, you feel free to pitch in, but how will, in your opinion, how will this intelligent process automation, a wider growth of intelligent technologies, not just not just process automation, but you guys are like, as the name suggests, edge tech, you, you're looking at everything that's brand new and fancy and cool. How, how, how's that going to affect the way we work in the future? I think it's, I, I don't want to be that guy who's just going to sit on the fence and say it's anyone's guess. <laughs> so um, I think it's, it's one of those things where if everything's moving the way that it seems like it's going to, where, as I, I mentioned before, a lot of the mundane stuff is going to, going to get cut out of work. If, if you think about, if you really sit down and think about how much stuff you do a day, that's probably not, necessarily you, you your creativity the skills that you've learned and all of this sort of stuff if you're really harsh with yourself that could comfortably be 50 percent or more of your day that you're doing stuff where realistically you're not you're not using your best skills it's not really challenging you and it's not what you you've studied for or anything like that and and i think we're all we could all i could sit here i guess and say well none of us are going to have a job in 20 years um, because computers going to take over everything and all of this sort of stuff. I don't believe that sort of thing to be true. I believe that we're always going to have need human interaction in, in a lot of things. But I think it's not crazy to think that in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, you could quite comfortably be doing a 35 hour, a 40 hour a week job in two days, in two and a half days, you could probably end up doing, and, and then it's, do you still do that job five days a week and then everyone's just doubly as productive or is it everyone just suddenly has a bit of a different work-life balance and it means that we're going to be spending maybe a bit more time out of work everyone is and, and all this sort of stuff I think it there's a lot of things to that could be said about it but I think if humans are going to be I guess held up for their creativity their skills their understanding on certain things maybe um, jobs are going to look a little bit different people are going to maybe be a bit more highly prized for different things than they are now. And certain things might might shift in that sense as well, in terms of what jobs people look for and all of this sort of thing. Yeah. I'll, I'll you know, we well. have a relatively positive view on the future, I think, you know. It's, <laughs> it's nice so, so Steve, I hope you're not the, you're not at the opposite end of the scale. No, no, uh, I was sort of totally on board there with what he was, was saying through that. Um, might come as a surprise to him, but uh, <laughs> so I, I just think that, you know, part of this is really going to be acceptance of change as well and, and what actually happens. You know, I think we are in the world and we've talked about the digital workforce and the human workforce. We are in a world where there is this thing now called a digital workforce. You know, there is technology that's going to do things for us that traditionally we would have had to have done. Um, and if you do look at how much time you spend sat in front of a computer, you know, interacting with systems in a way that's that's been the same for the last 30, 40 years, you know, that's changing. And, and that opportunity for those organizations who want to embrace it, you know, is a big opportunity and not just one to, to reduce costs, but actually to differentiate and do things differently. Um, and I think, you know, there is a lot of value in that and a lot of potential, and it just really requires the, the right mindset and mentality and culture to make that happen. All right, interesting. Hey, we have another question from the audience here or the participants here, and it, uh, this, is, this is really only in, in your... Uh, in your room, it's, it's, it's how hard is it to hire IPA developers at the moment? And what's the market like? 
I think the market's all right. The market, the market's good in, in certain areas, obviously without knowing location, skills, anything like that. A fairly, fairly broad brush. I think um, it's it's one of those things where you can quite easily find someone who says they know what they're doing, but to actually, if they actually know what they're doing, is a different is a different thing completely. Um, with all of the RPA vendors and this sort of stuff offering free training at the moment, you can quite easily get certified in any technology you want. And so if you're looking for people and then you see, oh, well, there's 20 certified people here who are all, all seem like they could be a good fit. I think you, you have to be really careful on when you're digging into actually what they've delivered, what they've delivered commercially and, and this sort of thing. And, and then try and work out all of these people are in demand. And because all of these people are in demand, they get the pick of, of what jobs they want. So I saw I saw a post recently and it was saying where, um, oh, we want to have the best people, but we don't want to pay the most. And we want them to be in the office five days a week, but we have a great culture. And it's like, but but do you? And a lot of these people are, are able to work five days a week, four days a week from home with one day in the office because they understand it's flexible and, and this way that we're working, especially in these types of jobs. So I think... It's okay if you're using the right people to help you. Um, but I think it, it really does depend. You need, to, you need to know what you want and you need to make sure that your process is, is down to a T because if you're speaking to someone and they're looking for a job, you can be certain they're speaking to five other people about the same job as well. Yeah, we, we, have, we have definitely discovered the same as a company. We, we're always on the, on the lookout for new talent and, and uh, it, it's it's not an easy market i don't think it's probably the most difficult market either but but uh, yeah i definitely agree with you on that one and uh, i've been working in it for the last 25 years and, and uh, i've yet to see a year where it's easy to find resources so so you know, it's, it's, it's one of those industries where you know it's the supply is not meeting meeting the demand very easily so um yeah uh, maybe a question for um there was one question actually that came in in advance as well. And, and this, this we can approach, I guess all three of you can approach this slightly from different, different points of view, which was what are the current development limits in terms of intelligent automation? And the limits you can define in your own ways. They don't have to be technical. So Steve, do you want to go first? Um. It's, it's an interesting one. Obviously, development limits can, can mean a, a whole variety of things. I think, um, you know, arguably process automation, you know, whether it's you know, RPA and so on, ha has been around for a few years now, and a lot of organizations have given it a go and achieved some success. Uh, I think there's some bigger picture things around how reliable and consistent and maintainable that is. Um, but I think probably what we're talking now is really about that transition into the AI world and how, uh, you know, actually, you know, machine learning, if you want to use that as part of your capability, um, you know, going beyond sort of platform capabilities around document processing, for example, to actually use machine learning, that is a different skill set to automation. Uh, if we pick up on the skills, it's a different sort of capability and team. Um, and it's a different mentality required for the organization a bit because there's, there's more to do with research you're not necessarily guaranteed to get an outcome that you expect. So you need that right mentality and that can set limits um, both on what you can achieve, um, but also the complexity of actually achieving that. And I'll hand over to someone else, otherwise I'll talk for ages. Carly, do you want to go first? No, yeah, this is a very interesting topic. And as Steve mentioned, limits are probably, you just, yeah, what, how do you define that? But I would say there's probably two things that come I come across all the time. And number one being that what type of a profile you actually engage into the automation projects. And it's as been talked earlier, it's it's not the super super techie type of automation when you use these intelligent automation technologies. At least the standard low code no code platforms and RPA. But the, in my opinion, the glue lies in or the kind of real beef lies in the fact that can you challenge as a technical person the business along the process and can you actually create the automation that brings value to the business and not just automate something because you can and those type of uh, I would say virtual cycles or kind of a dialogues and discussions that goes into the uh, kind of 
knowledge and expertise of the people. They really, if you're missing that, then then I see many times the whole kind of initiatives kind of falling apart a bit because of not challenging uh, from the tech side, the business and the business side, the tech side, and kind of have this virtual cycle going on. So, so I, I would call that as one of the great limitations in my mind at the moment, finding the right people with the right competence set to, to do the projects. Oli, what do you think? Yeah, I think, I, I think obviously it's just been touched on there about people and I'm not trying not to harp on about that side of thing. So I think um, obviously I, I don't think if you're looking at what these products can do, there isn't a huge amount of limitations on those if you have the right sort of people being able to develop it. But I think, um, as, as Steve mentioned as well, um, it's it's grabbing a lot of different people from different sectors. It's um, data scientists, machine learning engineers, RPA engineers. They're not the same people. They're not doing the same thing. And then also if your RPA team sits outside of IT, if your RPA team doesn't report into IT, and then you've got a team that reports into IT and then a team that reports into maybe a, a, a head of data or something along those lines. And you've got to converge all of those teams to make sure that they're all doing the right thing. I think that can often be quite a limitation unless you're building a specific, say, intelligent automation center of excellence where you're hiring every single person to sit under, say, one program lead or something along those lines. I think a lot of the limitation is just going to be getting that resource, even if you have all the resource within your company, just getting all of that resource to work together and to go there because they're going to be pulled three different ways by all of their different line managers and all of their different departments about having to do loads of other things. So I think sometimes the limitation is just the, the goal of the company at the start and really working towards reaching that. Fantastic. Yeah, I was, I was going to add, I, I have a completely different point of view myself, which is, which is very sort of come, comes down to the money. And, and to me, the limitation is, yeah, you can, you can achieve anything with these things, but you know, does it make sense financially in, in terms of like, how, how far do you want to push it? Because there's, there's a price tag attached to everything that we do. So very nice to see that we can all see the same question in very, very different, different light. Uh, we're sort of coming up to the end of our Q&A session here. Um, so, so I guess I will still hand over to the three gentlemen here um, uh, or for any, any final thoughts or, or closing, closing comments. And um, yeah, go ahead, Steve. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. Um, I, I suppose, and this is probably a bit of a theme of what I've been saying through this, is that we very much look at IPA as an opportunity to transform. And I, and I think the key bit that we would say is, is don't just look at it as an automation program, um, because it tends to be then that you're looking at just automating what you currently do. Um, and that's not really transformational. It's not really that innovative anymore. Um, so I think the, the opportunity potential is there is wide. Um, one thing, you know, sort of we would like to sort of offer to anyone who's, who's attended this uh, webinar, if you want to have a chat through IPA in the context of your business, talk about, get a bit of insight, a bit of inspiration, perhaps look at how you can make a difference in how you're approaching it or what you potentially can achieve or how you can work with your sea level perhaps to, to get the right vision and reality and you know expectation we're happy to have that conversation uh, we, we run sort of free workshops we'll spend a few hours with you um, just understanding where you are and, and trying to help you out um, and if you're interested in that feel free to email me direct uh, my email's there but we'll also include some details in the in the follow-up email after this thank you fantastic Oi. You're on mute, mate. <laughs> There's always one. Um, yeah, I, I think we see we speak to a lot of people and we speak to a lot of people who are saying that they want to do RPA, they want to do intelligent automation, they want to do everything all at once and they want to be the first person to get there and they want to beat everyone else and all of this sort of stuff. And I think while it's true that sometimes the early bird gets the worm in, in these sense, I think a lot of the time we're... Yeah, sometimes it's the second mouse that gets the cheese, if that makes sense. You, There's always a bit of risk going first. And if you can see what other people are doing and you can see the mistakes they've made and you can see how you can improve on those, sometimes that isn't a bad thing. I think sometimes it's, it's always good to try and look around you and, and not necessarily feel like you have to do everything all at once as much as you can do, but take those small steps and take them 
sort of one step at a time to make sure that you're doing the basics right first before you're heading on and just trying to do the, the most complex uh, processes you can possibly think of. Um, but yeah, as, as it's mentioned here, um, one of the cornerstones to a good COE and, and making sure that you get your, your RPA team right is, is the people. And we see all the time uh, mis little mistakes that we've, we've had the experience of seeing people make and, and knowing how to, how to fix them. So we're, we're happy to have a 15, 30 minute phone call with anyone who wants it just to work out how they're planning to grow, what their hiring process currently is, if there are any bottlenecks or anything that we can sort of just help you come out with a plan of action on, on what you can do to be able to fix that. There's a link there, but I'm sure my contact details and that will get sent out in the, the follow-up email as well. Fantastic. Maybe a final, final remark from digital workforce side. Uh, Carly, I can take this one. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, this this in terms of like we saw those polls and 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 also those uh, those questionnaire questionnaires in in advance that you know in terms of where where you are in your in your journey, we actually have a completely free online assessment tool available. There's a link below here uh, where you can you can do a self assessment. It takes about five to ten minutes only, so it's not a massive exercise, but it kind of puts you on the map. Uh, of, of, of this journey, like how far you, you are down the line. Um, I do have to say it, it is kind of like RPA geared in, in, in certain ways. So it's not completely uh, geared towards intelligent process automation, but it does give you a good insight in, in where you are today and some good pointers as to where you may want to go next. And, and uh, as mentioned, doesn't cost a penny. You can do it anytime. Just click on the link below, and and, and you can do it as many times over as, as you like. If you don't like the answers you got the first time, <laughs> so feel free to feel free to play with that one. Perfect. I would probably just add on my part that it's been a huge pleasure, as mentioned earlier, to be a part of this, and I really kind of think that what I have learned during the fa past five years is that. Ensure that you make yourself relevant for the core business. So find a way to automate the core as well along the way. And in my opinion, the best thing, a way to do that is to start with an E2E process assessment. How can you transform your core processes and building a business case on top of that? And I think that is my takeaway on, on this series, really. Fantastic. Yeah, and and, and uh, as mentioned in the beginning, we, we ran those seven mini webinar uh, series uh, videos or, or, or web webinar sessions that are available at any time online. So if if you missed one of those or, or even all of them, you can go back and 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 uh, and, and watch them. Uh, it's not a it's it's great talk. We have different different speakers in different sessions, and and we cover all those all those different topics. So. Highly recommend those if you if you missed them so far, and and we um, will definitely follow up on on this session as well, and uh, we hope to speak to you soon. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Good Thanks so much. Thank you.